I think we should start. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the computational approaches session. I'm Luciano Cascione, head of the bioinformatics core unit at the Institute of Oncology Research in Bellinzona. This afternoon, uh, we are having eight talks, five five minutes talks and three 10 minutes talks. And I'm very glad to co-chair the session with Francisca. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Francisca Singer and I'm a bioinformatics scientist at the clinical bioinformatics unit at Nexus Personalized Health Technologies at the ATH Zurich. Before we actually start with our first talk, I would like to remind every attendee that please that you can please use the uh, Q&A button below your Zoom window to post questions and um, try to make them concise in order to facilitate the, an easy discussion later on. And uh, with that, I want to introduce our first speaker today, which is Charlotte Sonneson from the group of Michael Stadler at the FMH in Basel. And she will talk about pre-processing choices um, and their effects on RNA velocity analysis. Thank you very much. So I will share my screen. Uh, okay, does this work? Okay, okay. So thank you very much, and uh, it's great to see so many people here actually. Um, and I'm happy to start off this session by talking a little bit, just to give a few um, highlights from our recent study on pre-processing choices and specifically quantification for RNA velocity in uh, single cell RNA seq. So I wanted to say uh, just a few words first about RNA velocity. So one of the reasons why it's becoming so very popular and it actually uh, also got the SIB prize for um, the resource uh, uh, bioinformatics prize last year is that it kind of allows us to infer um, things about the dynamics. So for example, related to a differentiation trajectory based on just snapshot uh, data from single cell rna -seq. Um, and the way that it does that is by um, first assuming that the snapshot actually contains cells from different parts of this trajectory uh, and then modeling together not just the mature mRNA but also the pre-mRNA in order to figure out for each gene in each cell whether the expression level of that particular gene at that point in time is on its way up or on its way down or staying stable. Uh, and the way that the RNA velocity is typically visualized or interpreted uh, is by projecting it onto a, a low dimensional embedding of the cells, like you see here to the right, where this, uh, the dots are different cells and these flow uh, lines indicate kind of the, um, the velocity flow, the main flow in this uh, data sets. So what did we do? Well, we were particularly interested in the abundance quantification. So how to get the, uh, the mRNA and the pre-mRNA counts that you need to do the velocity analysis. Uh, and the way we did that was that we looked at public data sets. So we uh, uh, collected some droplet single cell RNA seq data set where we knew that there was some kind of known dynamics, some trajectory, some differentiation trajectory, for example. Then we applied 12 different quantification approaches to each of these data sets. And these 12 approaches uh, represent four different software run in different ways. So uh, Velocito, Star Solo, Callisto Bus Tools, and Alvin run with different parameters. So each of these uh, uh, tools or approaches give us a pair of matrices of uh, pre-mRNA and mRNA counts. And for each of these pairs, we then apply the same pipeline of RNA velocity estimation to kind of keep that part consistent. And then we compare the results. So I will not go in too deep into the uh, results here for uh, lack of time. But I think one of the main messages that I really would like you to, to leave here with uh, is that the counting really matters. The way you get this uh, pre-mRNA and mRNA counts really uh, makes a difference. And it doesn't just make a difference on the count matrix in itself, it also propagates to the velocity estimates and to the biological interpretation. So what we see here is uh, two representation of the same data set uh, quantified in two different ways and then uh, RNA velocity estimated and overlaid onto this uh, UMAP representation. And the purple uh, arrows here indicate areas in these plots where actually the streamlines uh, or the estimated flow from the velocity actually point in completely opposite directions depending on how you do the actual uh, abundance estimation. 
so that's kind of uh, the, the first uh, takeaway. And in our study, we go more into detail in this. We try to explain why these differences occur, which methodological choices in the different approaches cause these differences and make some recommendations. So the other thing I wanted to uh, point to is exactly that. So we uh, also propose a workflow based on our evaluations. This is specifically for droplet single cell RNA-seq, for example, from 10x Genomics. So this workflow has two steps. So the first thing we need to do is to prepare the reference. We need to extract uh, transcripts and introns from the genome. Uh, and we uh, implemented this in a straightforward way in, in a bioconductor package called ISAR, which you can uh, use easily. And the second step then is that we do the uh, abundance estimation with Alvin, which is a command line tool uh, provided within the Salmon software suite. And those abundance estimates we then uh, re-import back into R with a, a bioconductor package called TXI Meta that also uh, reformats the data that you can directly feed it into the velocity pipelines. So if you want a detailed tutorial, uh, you can go to this, this URL here. Uh, and with that, I would like to round up just to say that there is a preprint if you want to know more. Um, you can uh, join me in the, uh, my poster room later this afternoon or uh, in the Meet the Speakers room. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Charlotte, for this great talk. And um, questions will, will follow in the Meet the Speakers room for the sake of time. OK, so now is the turn of Anna Koroleva from uh, Zurich University of Applied Sciences. She will talk about it towards creating a new knowledge base for literature-based discovery. So, yes, um, please, Anna. Thank you for introducing me. Um, let me start my screen sharing. Um, can you see my screen now? Okay, I hope you can. Um, so my name is Anna and I'm a postdoc working with uh, Maria Nissimo and Manuel Gil. And I'm going to present our ongoing work on creating a new knowledge base for literature-based discovery. Uh, sorry, I'm having some problems here. Sorry for that. Uh, so, first of all, I want to explain what is literature-based discovery, or LBD. It is a field of research aiming at discovering implicit knowledge by mining scientific literature. And this area emerged in the 1980s, when a computer scientist, Don Swanson, was manually looking through some um, titles of scientific papers, and he noticed some connections between certain concepts. For example, Reynolds disease is associated to um, parameters such as platelet aggregability and blood viscosity. And on the other hand, dietary fish oil is also related to platelet aggregability and blood viscosity. And although Reynolds disease and dietary fish oil never occur together in the literature, he supposed that dietary fish oil can be used to relieve the symptoms of Reynolds disease. And this was later confirmed clinically. So uh, Don Swanson formulated the first LBD paradigm based on uh, this discovery and some other discoveries he made. Uh, this paradigm is called the ABC paradigm, and it says that uh, a term A and a term C may never occur together in the literature. But if they're connected via some B terms, intermediate terms, it can mean that there is a meaningful connection between them. Uh, why does this matter? Uh, this kind of discovering this kind of connection can reduce the time for drug discovery and drug repurposing. But of course, if this is done manually, it still takes lots of time and effort. So nowadays, there are lots of automated systems that uh, try to perform literature-based discovery. And I want to describe how a typical LV system looks. So usually it starts, of course, from the literature, performs some syntactic parsing to represent each sentence as a tree. After that, a sem uh, semantic parsing is performed to produce some kind of uh, triples. A triple is um, a set of objects. Usually it's a subject, a predicate, and an object and it represents a relationship. For example, dietary fish oil improves um, blood viscosity. Uh, these triples align to ontologies and some knowledge bases to normalize the entities and to uh, retrieve some additional information. Um, all this is represented as a graph, and this graph is mined using some discovery algorithms to make some discoveries. 
And so for us, the most interesting point is the triple stores because most of the LBD systems do not make the first two steps themselves. They just use some existing triple store. And so the most commonly used knowledge base for LBD is called CMEDDD. But also it's widely used, it has some limitations. And so this motivates our work. Our goal is to create a new database for LBD addressing the limitations of CMEDDD. So what, what limitations and in what way do we want to address? Uh, CMEDDB uses methods such as rules and dictionary lookup. And we want to use more uh, state-of-the-art methods of um, natural language processing, such as machine learning and distance supervision. CMEDB uses only uh, midline titles and abstracts, which of course is not a complete uh, source of information on scientific publications. So we want to use full text from PubMed Open Access. CMEDB has limited coverage of 10 relation types. It only has 30 types of relations and the entities are based on the MLS thesaurus, so no other types of entities are present there if they're not present in the thesaurus. So we want to add more entity and relation types. And we plan to use um, OBO ontologies, that's open biomedical and biological ontologies, to retrieve some additional information on our, on our entities. And finally, we plan to use a different design of our database. We want to use RDF format following semantic web standards and that would allow us to provide a Sparkle endpoint to the, for performing queries on the database. And the last thing that I have to say is that um, the, the description of our future database and methods was accepted um, at the first international workshop on literature-based discoveries. So we have the approval of the community and we're working on it now. So that's it for me today. If you have any questions or comments, please um, join the poster session today or uh, drop me an email or we will meet in the meet the speaker session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. So now is the turn of uh, Yannine Bea from the uh, University of Lausanne. And he will talk about the uh, hot so hierarchical orthologous transcripts. Please, Yanni. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, you can. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. I'm glad to be here to present my postdoc project, Hierarchical Autologous Transcripts. First, I'm going to talk about autology inference. So, as you may know, there's many autology inference nowadays that aim to infer homologous relationships between genes, or autologous and parologous relationships. And to do that, they consider one canonical, often the longest, isoform for a gene and ignore alternative friendships. That's understandable, but that causes some issues. So first, uh, the longest isoforms are not always the best matching. Actually, they are not in 34% of the cases, which could lead to, to error in the inference. Then when you have autologous genes, some, some uh, sometimes are used for function transfer. But if you don't take into account alternative transcripts, then you can't know, for example, that one transcript is associated, uh, one function is associated to, for example, to transcript A2 in human, and there is no homologous transcript in, in mouse. So if you try to uh, transfer the function, then you're, you're doing uh, false guesses. And then, uh, if you don't take into account alternative transcripts, there are also no information about the evolutionary stories of alternative transcripts, which is problematic if you're interested in that. So my project goal is to uh, solve these issues by infer inferring hierarchical autologous relationship between alternative transcripts using hierarchical autologous groups as a base. So uh, hugs, hierarchical autologous groups that are available in HOMA are gene descended from a common ancestral genes at a given taxonomic range. Uh, so they are hierarchical because you can, uh, because actually they are nested groups. So you, they, they are grouped as the lowest level of the taxonomy and you can go up this way. So knowing that you can from the hogs derive some gene tree and using the isoform sequence, try uh, from that, to uh, get the evolutionary history of alternative concepts of, a, of genes in a hog. Again, I took a given taxonomic branch, what's called HOTS. 
Uh, to, do so, to do that, we first need a way to compare uh, alternative sponsors so that we plan to use flight alignment with our collaborator for the University of Sherbrooke. As the core, core concept of splice alignment is to align exons together according to similarity identity and conserve the order. So or, originally it was uh, designed to align CDS to the genome, but you can also use it for homology determinations. So to, to align homologous transcript together. So if you have similar exons in the same order in homologous genes, we can uh, hypothesize that, structure, that this structure probably existed in the common ancestor. So using that, then we get back to the species tree and we have the isoform sequence here. And going up in the tree, we're gonna um, do the spliced alignment of all the isoform and class the homologous isoform together. Yeah, for the hum, uh, human species, we have three group of isoform and we go up to the tree and when Adding the cat here, we know that we, we see that two of the groups uh, have a new sequence and this one have not. So what can this tell us? At first, we can know where are the gain and loss events of isoforms. So from this two, we could guess, for example, that one, uh, one gain of isoform occur in the common ancestor of human and mouse. And you also know what are the conserved isoforms of so between species for functional transfer or as a wall. So if you can, if one isoform is especially conserved, you could guess that it's a functional uh, isoform of the gene. So we, with that, we're, we are gonna, we have the sorry, evolutionary story of alternative transcripts and we can move toward new implications. So it could be used for genome annotations because if you know what the conserved isoform in a clad is, so you could look into a new genome of a species in this clad, uh, hypothesizing that the conserved isoform is also present. So you look for the exon and even make the yeah, hypothesis that the, the isoform exists. And you could also improve autology inference because this is not a trivial problem with particular difficult cases in case of duplication of differ differential loss. And if an org have not a parsimonious odds, so there is a lot of gain of losses of isoform, it could be a warning that we need to test other solution and find ones that could be more parsimonious. So here, here's to the application we could, there, there is a lot other you can, can imagine. So uh, now it concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I have a, a poster, the computational approach uh, station today. Thank you very much, Yanni. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your presentation. So, could you stop sharing your screen, yes. please? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So now uh, is the turn of Elena Montegro Borbola from the Computational Intelligence for Computational Biology Group. So please. Elena, we can't hear you. Okay, now, is it okay? Uh, well, thank you all for joining this presentation. My name is Elena, and I'm going to introduce you my master thesis project, which is about a computational approach on uh, decision making in the ICU. Why to focus on ICU to intensive care units? Well, these are very costly hospital units, both in terms of monetary and personal cost, and their use is, is expected to increase not only cases in the pandemic, like the one we are going through, but also because of the aging population. And these units have a particularity, that is that doctors must integrate a lot of complex data from a diverse range of patients. And this could hamper the fast decision-making. And in order to improve this decision-making, many people have uh, made use of the clinical information systems to develop machine learning approaches in order to, to improve it but not all of them have done in a real time manner, which would be a real approach that could actually be applied. Uh, some others, they, they have done it, for instance, for predicting mortality or sepsis risk, but we wanted to focus on pneumonia and influenza because it is one of the most common diagnoses. So can we detect this diagnosis from 
signalomics data, which is uh, the data from the signals that are uh, connected, that are uh, recorded from the patients, directly connected. And also, can we do it in a real time manner? Well, in order to do so, we extracted some data, we constructed a data set from MIMIC3, which is a database from ICU patients. We extracted the charted vitals as well as some laboratory tests in order to get a data set which is composed of over 9,000 samples from adults. And it has 35 features of the three different categories. First, dynamic and continuous, such as the heart rate or oxygen levels. Uh, second, dynamic discrete, such as the Glasgow Coma Scale, or constant, such as sex or age. And we only consider the first 24 hours of the study. And well, as you can imagine, the raw data is quite messy, it is incomplete, it has missing values and figures, and of course, the, the measuring time is quite irregular. Uh, so we needed to pre-process this data uh, and, and to, to make it useful for a machine learning classification algorithm. And we input the missing values and we fit the data into 30 minutes interval. From there, we de derive it in two different data sets. Well, it's just the same, but organized differently. One is uh, a full version of it. Another one is a gliding window in order to, to try, test it for a real-time application. And this is used for uh, binary classify the samples. Uh, these are the results so far. On the left side, we, you can see a figure where the accuracy from different unsupervised and ensemble methods um, is shown for both the three climbing window data set and the whole data set. And on the right, um, different neural network architectures test accuracy. And the neural networks do not happen to perform very well. We expected that recurrent neural networks would be of great use because their tendency of uh, catch temporally patterns, but they don't have very uh, strong accuracy. But however, the two of the ensemble methods have a very uh, strong accuracy with almost one, treating one in the gliding window version of the data set. Those are the random forest and the bugging classifier, as you can see here in the picture. The others did not perform that well as for a real case application. So in order to conclude, uh, we, the research question got answered. The, we can detect the pneumonia and influenza diagnosis from signalomics data, but on a window version of the data set. And as this window can be even shortened, then we could do it in a real time manner. Um, therefore, implementing this approach into the ICU could help doctors to early detect patients with a pneumonia and influenza diagnosis. And I wanted to thank uh, you, all of you, for your time and listening to me, and also to my team for their support. Uh, here are some of my contact details. I'll be also presenting this poster uh, later on in the poster session, and I'll be happy to answer or comment or whatever question or comment you've got. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Alan, Elena. Uh, there are a couple of questions for you, Yanni and Anna, but we will answer in the meet the speaker session. So, so now we have another talk. And this talk will be given by Maria Bilou from the Computational Cancer Biology Group at the University of Lausanne. Hello. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Um, hello, thank you. And thank organizers for giving uh, this opportunity to present. My name is Maria and I'm a PhD student in uh, the group of uh, David Kreller. And uh, uh, today I would like to talk to you uh, about simplification of single cell amnestic data. Um, as you know, single cell amnestic is a powerful technique for studying uh, cell populations. And as bioinformaticians, you might be familiar uh, with the, its main feature and at the same time a uh, challenge. It's high dimensionality, meaning that each cell is represented by thousands of uh, uh, genes. But with the development of uh, technology, we have more and more cell sequence per experiment. And you may expect that many of those cells carry redundant information. And of course, it is more challenging to visualize and analyze such a large scale data sets. So, 
the objective of my project is to reduce number of cells by merging uh, very similar cells carrying uh, redundant information into super cells. So basically to go from a large scale data set to a smaller version. But what is more important is to demonstrate that this uh, smaller uh, uh, data set can be used for the downstream analysis, which usually includes clustering, differential expression, gene gene correlation, etc. And today I will focus on this part and I'll try to convince you that we can use this simplified data set uh, because the results of those two analyses are quite consistent. As an example, I will use this data set of CD8 T cells. CD8 T cells are known to be very heterogeneous, but not with very distinct clusters, as you can see here. This is a network view representation of a single cell analytic data. Probably you are more familiar uh, with the UMAP or TSNI, but this is kind of equivalent. Uh, here, as at, in uh, TSNI or UMAP, each dot represents a cell and proximity represents a uh, transcriptional similar similarity. And here you can see a simplified version of this uh, network, a network of supercells uh, at a green level of 50, which basically means that we have 50 times less supercells in this data set than single cells in the initial data set. So the first step of the downstream analysis is usually clustering. So let's just cluster those two data sets. From this plot, we can see that clustering are quite similar, but uh, let's uh, uh, investigate this in a more systematic way. For this, we are using adjusted trend index, which is a measure of clustering similarity, and we are comparing clustering similarity of supercell data to this clustering of single cell data. And here in this red line, you can see that this index is quite consistent uh, with the grain level, uh, and also it is better than our negative control, in which we randomly group cells into supercells, and of course, uh, it, and also it is uh, quite consistent with subsampling as an alternative way of uh, simplifying large-scale data set. But what is more important is that discrepancy between uh, clustering of supercell data and single cell data is of the same level as if we would apply a different clustering algorithm to the single cell data. So once we have our clusters, the next question I usually will ask, uh, what are the markers of those clusters? Basically, which genes are upregulated in one cluster compared to others? So uh, and here I'm comparing those two set of genes defined on single cell and super cell level. And here again in red, you can see that we can recover up to 35% of the initial marker, uh, even if we reduce number of cells to 100 times. And of course, it's not, it's not the case anymore for subsampling. Okay, and uh, at the last uh, brief uh, slide, I would like to uh, also introduce you that uh, uh, by merging very similar cells together, we can also improve some signal between some gene-gene relationship. As in this small example, you can see that those two genes, which we know are um, supposed to correlate since they are markers of the same as a population, uh, have better person correlation in our uh, simplified data set uh, and also have better pattern of their mutual expression. Of course, this is only one e uh, example, very tiny, but if you want to see more and to discuss, you are welcome to join me during this poster session uh, this afternoon. And with this, I would like to conclude uh, and to say that supercell uh, quite well preserves uh, clustering and markers uh, uh, recovery. It also improves gene gene correlation, but what still has to be assessed is how much this facilitates the analysis of large data sets, because the idea is to uh, use this approach to simplify larger data sets in order to make the analysis faster and easier. And with this, I would like to thank to David Keller and all people involved and to you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria, for, for the talk. And uh, questions, uh, I think, will arrive soon in the meet, meet this yeah, Thank you. Uh, thank let you. me introduce you. So Fabio Rinaldi is a group leader at the University of Zurich and Hitzia in Lugano. Uh, he's going to talk about a fast, efficient, accurate entity recognition for biomedical applications. So please, Fabio. Yes, thank you. So I'll try to share my slides. Let's so hope it works. Uh, oh, uh, I'm going to present uh, um, work that uh, my group, uh, a former group at the University of Zurich, has done uh, in the past few years and that I also intend to continue with my new group in Lugano. I recently moved from the University of Zurich to Lugano, where I 
I am uh, heading a new uh, NLP group, natural language processing. Um, so the reason I'm presenting today at this conference, and the reason I'm also a member of the Swiss Institute of Informatics, is that uh, we have worked for many years on uh, information extraction from the biomedical literature. Um, so in this talk, I will present a few tools that we developed over the years. Um, starting with the Biotherm app, which is an aggregator of biomedical terminologies, OGA, which is an entity annotator. And then we'll describe some of the methods that we've used. So what is the Biotherm app? The Biotherm app is a, uh, is a um, aggregator, as I said before, of biomedical terminologies. What does it mean? Basically, we go um, and collect terminological information about biomedical entities from um, a number of reference databases. Some of them you see in this uh, graph here, in this um, figure. So for example, the cell ontology, cell servos, KB for chemical, uh, Swiss prot, and so on and so forth. So we fetch the terminology from those databases, we put them together and we provide them for uh, a, a, a annotation service. And by fetching, I don't mean simply, uh, oops, simply uh, going there, downloading them and, uh, and, and, and putting them together. What I mean is a dynamic service which automatically checks the original resource every time you want to um, uh, regenerate your terminology list. So basically this interface, which is uh, accessible from our website, will check if the original resource has been updated and if so, we'll offer you uh, a possibility to update each resource. Then when you're satisfied, you have most up-to-date resources that you need, you can select the resources that you need, ticking in these boxes, and then you can download the corresponding terminologies. And this way we keep our terminology synchronized with the original databases. You see we have uh, uh, SwissProt, we have Cellosaurus, and many of the resources of the Swiss Institute of Informatics as well. Um, so, uh, what, um, so these resources can be used by any text mining system, but I'll sh let me show you how uh, we make use them of them in our system. Um, this is an example. Basically, these dictionaries are then stored together into our internal uh, dictionary. And this dictionary can be used for uh, annotate text, uh, typically scientific, biomedical scientific literature. You can see here the different categories that we annotate as an example of an article. Um, in this example, it's derived from a recent application that we did for COVID-19. So we extended our dictionary with um, COVOC, a dictionary uh, provided by the group of Patrick Brook. Uh, so, which includes also the most recent terminology of uh, uh, regarding COVID-19. This is also accessible from our website. Um, so, it's not only a simple, a, a nice interface that you can use to browse articles, it's also an annotation service. Uh, it means that we provide a, a fully-fledged RESTful API, which uh, you can use to query articles. Basically, you can submit text to be annotated and get back from the system uh, the annotations, the original annotation, in many different formats. Um, we also evaluated this service in a number of challenges. I mentioned this in a moment. Uh, if you follow the URL that I provide in this slide, you will get the description of this RESTful service. Um, the URLs will also be provided in the final slide. This is an example how to use the uh, web annotation system. We just uh, provide a query, automatic query to the um, service. Uh, this is the URL that you have to query. And you submit text like this. Or you can submit, so this is um, if you want to submit your own text, but you can submit also a PubMed ID or a PubMed Central ID. In this case, the system will automatically download for PubMed, from PubMed or PubMed Central the corresponding article. Uh, abstract in case of PubMed, full text in case of PubMed Central, annotate it and give it back to you the results. As I mentioned, you can get the results in many different formats. Uh, probably the most convenient formats, format for further processing is uh, the TSV format. Uh, you can get also an XML format or, a, um, or, or, or um, uh, different formats allow um, uh, visualization of the content, of the annotations within the article. But the TSV format, um, of which you'll see an example, is particularly uh, practical for further um, uh, processing of this data. Basically, this, you, you have to understand this um, uh, figure as the same line uh, split in two. And uh, basically, we have four different annotations here. Uh, 
uh, within an article. In this case, it's the article I provided before, so it doesn't have a document ID. If I had submitted a PubMed ID instead, we will see at the PubMed ID. In this case, we just submit the text, so there is no document ID. And we see the position in the text in which annotation has been found, the term that has been matched, a preferred form for that term in, within the reference database, uh, the entity identifier in the reference database, and here in origin you see the actual reference database. So for example, uh, the word uh, pneumonia has been found in, uh, in, in, in mesh diseases and also in CPD dictionary. And, uh, and, um, and the other entities have been found in mesh. And here you see the corresponding identifiers within the original database. Additionally, where we can find uh, the same term in, or what, when the original resource provides a link from the term, from the concept to UMLS, we provide also the UMLS identifier. In this way, you can resolve some uh, um, um, cases, cases in which the same term appears in multiple resources, like this one where pneumonia appears both in mesh and CTD. Obviously, we, um, we, they might have different identifiers, in this case not, but they should be mapped to the same identifier in the, in the UMLS. So uh, this would allow to aggregate um, cases where there are multiple annotations. So this web service has been tested on in a competition uh, two years ago where different text mining system were uh, mm, attempted to solve an online task uh, or were tested uh, in ter for their efficiency in solving annotation tasks. Uh, and uh, you can see the results here, our system was the best. And we had a uh, very efficient, so this is a very efficient system. Recently, we also, uh, just of the interest, processed uh, literature related to COVID-19. And you can see uh, um, uh, a graph that shows the number of publications related to COVID-19 in recent years. I commented this this morning in the COVID-19 session to which I was invited. And again, you can find more information at the link at the bottom of the page. Now, I have a few more slides to describe the methods that we use, but I will go very fast because I don't have time. So basically, there are two steps in order to recognize biomedical entities. One is to recognize the span of text that describes the entities, like the example, skin tumor and beta catenin. And the next step is to find in the dictionary, in the original repository, to what was the ID of that resource. So what concept, to which concept that particular piece of text, text corresponds. This seems easy, seems easy, but it actually there are many problems of ambiguity in, in, uh, in this case that have to be solved. So we actually try to solve, the typical approach is to do this sequentially, but we try to solve it in parallel uh, with a new approach, like we could join training approach, for which we based, uh, for which we use two methods. One is bi bidirectional long short term memories. Um, and another method is using BERT, which is a tool uh, uh, which is now very popular in the computational linguistic community. Again, I don't have much time um, to describe this, but I'm happy to answer question, uh, questions if anyone is interested. And then basically we combine annotations that provide at different levels and we try to, to, to see how compatible different levels are. And then from this, we get the best uh, possible annotations. Um, we also evaluated um, this approach in a recent competition last year what the goal was to rate the quality of the annotation. The previous competition was about the efficiency of the system. Again, we were the best system. In this competition was about the quality of the annotation. And again, we had uh, very good results. I don't have the time to describe them in detail, but basically you can see here that we evaluated each of the um, dictionary categories that we have. Uh, for example, Uberon is one of them, one of the dictionary for, or resources provided by this SID. And, all of them, and, and, and for each of them, we have a different evaluation and we, um, we basically do very well on, on all of them. Uh, so I come to the conclusions. Uh, what I presented uh, is basically a solid, easy to use, efficient dictionary based solution with uh, uh, lexical resources that are constantly up to date. So we constantly synchronize our lexical resources with the original database. This is done through the Biotherm app, uh, which collects the resources and Augur, which is the efficient annotator. Augur is, uh, on, on, on the core of Augur is a dictionary-based system, but on top of them, we implement a neural network uh, solution to, um, evolve, uh, to remove ambiguity and get the best possible annotations. Um, and we can apply this over several different uh, types of text. We apply typically on the scientific literature, but we have also projects where we apply this to clinical records and to social media. 
Um, and I have um, many interesting things to say also about social media, if, uh, if I have the time, obviously I don't have now. So the links uh, at the bottom of the slide provide additional information about our approach and uh, system, which is also fully accessible. It's accessible both via API, as described, through a web interface, and also it's, the code is fully available. Um, if you want to um, put information, feel free to contact me at the address that you see below at the, at the bottom of the slide, which is my name, Fabio, at itzia.ch. Itzia is the um, institute in, in Lugano, the Bella Molle Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Fabio, for your presentation. So we have a question for you from Anna Claudia Sima. And uh, she asked, how does the accuracy of the annotations generated by the system depends on the length of the text analyzed? It doesn't depend on the length of the text. I mean, the text can be as long as, as, uh, as, as much as you want. The quality of the annotation is always the same because it's local. It's basically a local problem to decide within the context in which a term appears. Uh, and the efficiency of the system also doesn't depend on the length of text in the sense that we have implemented a way to do this that is uh, uh, um, constant in the length of the text. The text can be of any length, the terms can be of any length, the, the speed of the system will always be the same. Obviously, if you double the size of the text, you get uh, double the time to do the annotation, but I mean, it's constant in relation to the size of the text. Thank you very much, so I think that now is... That brings us to, to the last talk of the session, which is then from Maciek Bach from the University Thanks. of Basel. Yeah. Yes, I should stop here. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, let me just share my screen now. Okay, can you hear me? Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, wait. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'll now uh, present you uh, my PhD project, which uh, uh, is a novel approach to detect the influence of RNA binding proteins on the processing of mRNA. So essentially, I, uh, without further ado, I'll work on alternative splicing. Please note the purple exon here, which is the so-called cassette exon or, or skipping exon, which can be included or excluded in the uh, in the mature mRNA, therefore in the later in the amino acid sequence, and it affects, of course, the structure and the properties of the pro protein. Uh, this is a simple case of a case of a splicing event. And my main question that I, what I, what, that I address is which RNA binding proteins uh, regulate the inclusion of such cassette exons? Uh, in, of course, in, in normal conditions, but also in diseases, is there any dysregulation? And the, my approach to address this question is that I quantify now two, two values. On one side, you can see that I can define a region. In this case, it's upstream free prime splice site. And if there is a regulator to, to regulate the inclusion of an exon, it would bind, so it would have a binding site there. So I can quantify the binding in, in sense of row K mer counts or more elaborate. If you have a weight matrix for a RBP, we can have a, we can calculate a probability of a binding of a motif to the sequence. But on the other side, if I have RNA seq data for every such alternatively spliced exon, once I perform transcript quantification, for every such exon, I can calculate the inclusion of uh, the total expression of transcripts that include a given exon and total expression of transcripts that could include it. And therefore, the ratio of these two is what we call inclusion fraction, or also known as the PSI score. So we have these two quantities, and now we can put them together. Uh, but before we, okay, before we do that, uh, let me tell you that my tool, the method I developed, the tool I developed, works that, such that in parallel, I scan distinct regions. So that in the end, it's also a sliding window approach. So that in the end, we have, once I get results, it's like a, we have a nice profile of regulation. So I have an insight into position-wise information about the, the, the regulation. So we started modeling with looking at the distribution of the, of the inclusion fractions. And they are distributed as in this histogram. This turns out it can be well fitted by a beta distribution. And this beta distribution would naturally arise if the inclusion fraction would have a form of a logistic function. And now if I specify, a param specify parameters, I can have an 
act most importantly, the activity of a given motif in a given RNA-seq sample. And this is what drives, together with the quantified binding, what, this is what drives the in, uh, uh, exon inclusion and exclusion. And therefore, I can rewrite the uh, inclusion fraction explicitly with the parameters of the model. And having that model and knowing the values which I, which I quantified, uh, we can write a likelihood for the whole data set from, from RNA-seq data under the such model. And conceptually, it's very easy. Conceptually, it's just a, it's a consecutive series of coin tosses when you can have an exon inclusion and exclusion, a success or failure. Uh, so we have this model. We, we optimize it uh, by an EM algorithm. So we find maximum likelihood estimates for the parameters of the model. And we are in, mostly interested in these activities, right? So we have per sample per motif activities, which are, then get propagated into Z scores and aggregated in the end into per motif Z scores. So a sample wise aggregation. And this last uh, value per motif Z score is what tells us how well a given motif explains the differential inclusion of cassette exons. So I, then I, when we plotted the distribution of these z-scores, turns out the distribution is, is in this histogram, and we uh, developed another model. So now we have a mixture model. Uh, this is essentially a mixture of a Gaussian and the uniform, and uh, the idea is just to detect outliers. But rigorously speaking, it's a mixture model. Uh, we optimize it again. We find, find maximum likelihood estimates for the parameters of these components. And we can say that we will say that motives that are statistically significant are such that uh, with high posterior probability, we can say that they come from the, the uniform components, not from the Gaussian. That's how we assess statistical significance. And I, I'll just briefly mention that uh, my colleagues uh, in, in the group were working on differential cleavage and polyadenylation, which is one more layer of, uh, of regulation of gene expression. And uh, please notice, oops, sorry, please notice here, yeah, uh, please notice here that if you have these distinct poly A sites, one can uh, per, uh, build similar models. So we define a region with, uh, in the proximity of the poly A site. We quantify binding of distinct motifs in that region. And now for every poly A site, we uh, can have a usage of a poly A site in a given RNA example. This usage comes from just uh, aligned uh, reads for the read from the read coverage. And uh, here we have these two quantities. And again, there is a model. They developed a model that uh, calculates activities, Z scores, and in the end tells us by the Z scores which motives explain the usage of poly A sites. And uh, I'll just, this is the last slide. I'll just show you uh, example results. Uh, so I took RNA-seq data uh, of HNRNPC Nogdan, which is a known regulator of uh, alternative splicing. And uh, it turns out that, well, we, we, well I plot here the motives with, which is most statistically significant with the highest activity, which turns out to be this 5U motif. And it ties nicely together to the literature uh, because this is the known binding site for the for the HNRNPC, so we kind of like we we uh, re recon not reconstructed, but we captured the correct motive. So it's like a positive control. And from these heat maps, these are heat maps of Z scores or per, or per sample Z scores. And uh, from these heat maps, I can learn or we can learn that uh, uh, the there is if HNRNPC is binding in the proximity of the splice sites. Uh, then this, we can st say that there's a statistically significant uh, regulation of the inclusion of, of, of these exons. Similarly, uh, that if it binds a little downstream to the poly A sites, it has a role on uh, the usage of these poly A sites. Also notice that since uh, in, the, in knockdown, actually, we have a positive Z scores, it would mean that in the absence of HNRNPC, the exons are included and the poly A sites are used. So we also have this information about the directionality of the, of the, uh, of the, of the, this is the mode of action. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge my group, which is a great, uh, uh, great environment to work with, uh, very stimulating. Uh, most importantly, Professor Michaela Zavolan uh, on the right here in the picture. Uh, who is my PI. Also, I'd like to thank a lot Professor Eric van Nimwegen, 
who helped me a lot with the statistical modeling, and Andreas Gruber uh, is a postdoc, and uh, I started this project with him, and well, we are finishing it together, but he like he he led me into it. Thanks a lot. Sorry for the problems at the beginning. No problem. You are right on time now, so um, thank you for the talk. And um, maybe just one question before we move to the other room. Um, I was wondering how are um, how is this applicable to different types of organisms? Is this somehow changing the model or the weights that you can? No, um, no. no, no. It's, uh, uh, organism actually doesn't matter. So run. I, I usually when I run this, I test human and mouse uh, RNA seq data. But no, it's essentially you, you have to provide well, RNA seq data of a given organism and mm -hmm. the annotation. So the genome mm -hmm. sequence, the, the uh, genomic regions in, in GTF, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have the resources for a genome, and also the, if you would have a, it would be nice if you would have the annotation of poly A site atlas for a mm -hmm. given organism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so given you have some resources about the genome, you can plug it in and you can run the analysis on RNA seq data you want. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. All so right, thanks. With that, we would like to conclude the session and encourage people to join us um, in the Meet the Speakers room. The link you can find on the web page, and we will directly transit to this other webinar. So, thanks a lot to our speakers, and uh, see you in a minute. Thank you very much. Thanks.